When I was packing my bag recently for a family trip to Austria, I wanted to keep my bag light, so I tried to pack as little photography equipment as possible. So I started thinking, if I could only bring one lens with me, what lens would that be? And that reminded me of a question that photographers get asked a lot, the age-old if you could only have one lens question. If you could only have one lens for the rest of your life, if you only had the budget for one lens, or, in my case, if you only have space for one lens, what would you bring? Now, I've never formally addressed this question, but I think it's a great question, especially for people starting out, because it gives you an idea of what kind of lens you should buy first, and what kind of lens will provide you with the most value. When I started getting into photography over lockdown, the first lens I bought was a Tamron 17 to 70 mm f2.8. The idea was that if I get a solid zoom lens that does a decent job at all of these different focal lengths, I won't ever need to buy another lens. Good logic, right? I knew prime lenses were good, but I thought that having a zoom lens is basically like having multiple prime lenses in one. Now, looking at my lens collection and the money I've spent on non-zoom lenses, I was obviously wrong, right? Like, there's still a good reason to purchase a prime lens, like its sharpness or usually a good low light performance because prime lenses can be f1.4, whereas zoom lenses tend to be capped at f2.8, which means they let in less light you have a less shallow depth of field and overall a less sharp image. But I stand by the fact that A, the Tamron zoom lens was a great purchase and B, that if I could only have one lens for the rest of my life, it would be the Tamron. And here's why. Now I'm not going to dive into a super technical review about the Tamron. For that kind of content, I really recommend the YouTube channel Arthur R, who does excellent deep dives into lenses for Sony cameras. This video will focus more on my thoughts picking this lens as my favourite and talk about my day-to-day -day experiences using this lens in the past year as well as my long-term thoughts and some example shots that I got with this lens. Now I know picking a lens can be super overwhelming, especially when you're just starting out, so I've tried to keep this video as summarised as possible and I've timestamped all the different chapters in the video to help you decide whether or not this lens is worth getting for your Sony APS-C camera. Throughout this video I'm also putting in some example shots I've gotten with the Tamron to help you get an idea of what sorts of photos are possible with this lens. Now before I talk about why I bought this lens in the first place, let me give you some quick basic information about the Tamron. So this lens is made for Sony APS-C cameras, so you have to multiply its focal length by 1.5 times. This gives you an equivalent of a 25.5 to 105mm focal length. It's pretty good weight-wise with 520-ish grams, uh, it doesn't feel super front-heavy once attached to the camera, and it's comfortable to work with. There's a rubber ring at the back, so it's moisture-resistant, which is definitely nice to have, and it also has vibration control meaning the lens has stabilization. This means that it's a good match for any Sony APS-C camera, whether they have IBIS or not. Needless to say, it's also an electronic lens, which means it has autofocus, and in the case of this Tamron, the autofocus works very well. Now, with the basic information out of the way, let's talk about why I initially bought the Tamron then. I decided pretty quickly that my first lens was going to be a zoom lens. I didn't know it was the Tamron yet, but I thought that I wanted to practice taking photos at different focal lengths because I wasn't quite sure what my style of photography was going to be going forward. I wanted a zoom lens that allowed me to take fairly wide shots of buildings, nice portraits of people when I zoom in a bit, and then get some cool landscape or detail shots when I zoom all the way in. When researching zoom lens comparison, I realized that you can go deep in comparing every single aspect of a lens. There's sharpness, chromatic aberration, zoom range, stabilization, and so on and so on. But that's too much, you know? And honestly, I don't really care that much about most of those things. For example, I wouldn't want to pay double for a lens that's just slightly sharper than the other option, right? I mean, I take photos for Instagram. I don't need the sharpest lens in the world paired with the sickest sensor there is. I checked a lot of the lens comparisons on YouTube, and honestly, I couldn't really tell the difference most of the time anyways. So I thought, if I can't see the difference as a photographer, people on Instagram probably aren't going to be able to either. So personally, during the lens selection process, I boiled my criteria down to these. Number one, what's the zoom range and aperture? Number two, how much does it cost? That's it. Very simple, right? So when I bought my A6500 on eBay, it came with a Sony 18 to 105mm f4 lens. While it did have a nice zoom range, I didn't like the fact that it only went down to f4. As someone who does a lot of nighttime photography, I thought that f4 wasn't letting in enough light, and I wanted to have an f2.8 zoom lens. So after a quick look online, the three most popular choices seem to be 1. The Tamron 17 to 70 f2.8 2. The Sony 16 to 55mm f2.8 G and 3. The Sigma 18 to 50mm f2.8 now for me it was a pretty quick decision. In terms of zoom range, the Tamron wins. And in terms of aperture, they're all the same. They're all capped at f2.8. For me, the Sony was almost out immediately. I thought to myself, why would I pay almost double for a lens that has a smaller zoom range than the Tamron? 
Now a lot of people will bring up the sharpness argument about how the Sony is a sharper lens and how the Tamron goes softer between 50 and 70. But my argument for that always was I'd rather have a slightly soft image all the way zoomed in at 70 mil than no image at all in that zoom range. So for me, it was an obvious pick between the Tamron and the Sony. Now cost-wise, the Sigma definitely wins with a price point of around 400 pounds. I still went with the Tamron though, for the same reason of, I want to be able to zoom all the way to 70. So if you're a photographer in the same situation, just consider what kind of photos you want to take and consider the kind of focal ranges that you would need for said shots. Another thing that was nice to have, but not crucial, was stabilization. Now, because I have an A6500, which has IBIS, I didn't need a stabilized lens, but the Tamron does have stabilization or vibration control, they call it, which is nice to have, which means that the Tamron would pair well with any Sony APS-C camera, regardless of whether or not they have IBIS. So this would include the A6000 all the way to the A6600. Okay, so now you know why I bought this lens in the first place, and it's been around over a full year now since I've got it. So here's my experience using the Tamron lens and why it would be my pick for the favorite lens or the lens I would use for the rest of my life. A quick look at my channel and you'll quickly see that this lens has done absolute bits for me and my photography career. What I use my camera for can be divided into three main categories. One, paid events photography, two, travel photography, and three, portrait shoots with models. While I tend to use my prime lenses for the third category, the uh, portrait shoots, the Tamron isn't shit at portraits. I just happen to have better prime lenses that go down to f1.4 for lovely, blurry, backgroundy portrait shots. Now, for events photography and travel photography, the Tamron is an absolute beast. So, starting with events photos. If I'm taking photos in a nightclub or some other ball venue or a, or a dinner, you name it. I don't want to be swapping lenses all the time. At an event, I can easily end up taking over a thousand photos in a night, which includes photos of the venue, performing artists, and groups of guests anywhere between two to 30 people. Do I want to change lenses in a dark room filled with drunk people waiting to get their photo taken? The answer is probably no. And while yes, I can take really nice photos with a Sigma 56mm f1.4 of like a single person, as soon as their mates come and they want a group shot of let's say 10 to 15 people, I'd have to back up like 10, 20 meters. And that's simply not possible in a lot of venues that I work in. Another solution would be changing my lens. But again, I just don't want to change my lens that often. Now, sometimes you do want to take a nice portrait at an event. You know, maybe the location is really nice or you bump into a special person that you might want to impress or you want to make sure you get a nice photo of. For example, Ali Abdel, who I ran into in this YouTube video. But it would be fair to say that 99% of my events photos are taken using the Tamron. In terms of aperture, the fact that the Tamron lens only goes down to f2.8 doesn't actually really bother me. Because if I'm taking a shot of a group of people, I don't actually want the depth of field to be too narrow, because otherwise the person at the front might be in focus, but their mates in the back won't be. So I tend to stay around f4, f4.5 for those photos anyways. While I did pay £200 more for the Tamron than I would have done for the Sigma lens, I'm very happy with this lens. I'm happy with its zoom range, its performance, its sharpness, and as you can see in this video, where I tried to earn as much as I could with photography in one week, I was able to earn the money I spent on the Tamron back very quickly. All right, next up, we've got travel photography. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while, you'll quickly notice that I love traveling and taking photos on trips. I've been to a bunch of different countries this year with my camera, and the one thing apart from the actual a6500 camera body that's consistently been with me is the Tamron 17 to 70 f 2.8 lens. Now this is another more obvious pro of the Tamron lens. It's not too big, it's not super bulky, so when you put it on your camera it's not going to be super front heavy. It's going to meet like 80% of your photography needs, so if it is the only lens in your bag when you're traveling, you'll probably be fine. While traveling around new places, you're not always going to know what it is exactly that you're going to be taking a photo of. And I think that's part of the fun of it, right? The uh, exploration and the spontaneity. You might take a wide angle shot of a building, then do some street photography, and then take some portraits of your friends. Oh, but then you want to take a photo of that mountain in the distance. You don't want to stop and change your lens every time you want to take a photo of a new thing. Capturing memories is the name of the game here. And you don't want those memories to be of you frantically changing your lens in like a new place that you haven't been to before, worried that you might be making yourself a target to potential pickpockets that are eyeing up all that expensive camera gear in your backpack. So when I'm traveling, I love using this shoulder bag that comes with the PGY Wombo, which is a camera backpack that I use. And inside this little bag, I can fit my camera with two lenses. So that's usually the Tamron 1770 
or the Samyang 12mm. Um, that way I'm covering 12mm as well as 17 to 70 which is a nice focal range to have when traveling. And you know, this way I'm not really walking around with a lot. I'm not walking around with a really heavy camera backpack that's packed to the brim in the heat of whatever foreign country I'm currently in, regretting all of my life choices of becoming a photographer. Wide shots, tight shots, you name it. The Tamron's going to be your best friend, especially when doing daytime travel photography. And there's a pretty big caveat here, however. If you primarily take photos in low light situations, the Tamron won't be your best pick, as it doesn't have the widest aperture at f2.8. Now it is possible, I've taken plenty of nighttime shots with the Tamron. In fact, I've done a video here during nighttime photography around London using the Tamron f2.8 lens. The stabilization in the lens does help with letting you slow down the shutter speed and let in a bit more light without having super shaky, blurry images. But there are definitely better options out there for nighttime photos. Any of the Sigma Trio f1.4 prime lenses, for example, are great for low light shots. Now, in summary, the lens that I would pick for the rest of my life is the Tamron 17-70 f2.8 lens. Because one, it's sick for events, two, is really sick for travel photography. Three, it's not that expensive, and four, you can use it for nighttime photography, but it's not the best. This is the first time me doing a video of this style, so if you made it all the way to the end, thank you very much. Let me know if you liked it in the comments below and what I could do differently. I hope you enjoyed this video as always, and I'll see you next time.